Well, thank you all for coming, and thank you for having me to um, this uh, meeting. Uh, it's great to be here, and uh, I guess I'll apologize that Forrester couldn't host, but uh, thank you to IBM for hosting. Um, so uh, Rachel did a very uh, thorough uh, introduction, um, but I just wanted to add, I've been with Forrester for about 11 years now, spent about the last seven or eight of that in uh, our customer experience practice, and I actually just finished my master's degree at Bentley last year. I went back to, to school because um, I'd sort of come up through Forrester and gotten the high level sort of customer experience <coughs> expertise and focus, but I, I really felt like I was lacking sort of that, that grounding fundamentals uh, in user experience that um, uh, I was hoping to get from the degree program. So it was uh, uh, like many of you in the audience, uh, that was at least I got a bit of exposure to that at Bentley. So tonight I wanted to talk to uh, talk about how the rise of customer experience uh, that Forrester has been tracking uh, will elevate user experience. Um, so I'm going to go through uh, three agenda items. I think there'll be plenty of time at the end for questions. Uh, it's a pretty small group, so if you have questions uh, throughout, please feel free to just raise your hand and, and we can we can pause. Uh, if you have a question, I'd imagine some other people are wondering something similar as well. Um, and then, of course, we've got refreshments, I think, afterwards, so I'll hang around and we can continue the conversation. Uh, so first, I'll talk about uh, the age of the customer. And this is a, a big trend that we see for companies. I'll talk about the implications. And then second, I'll talk about how this is leading to uh, customer experience becoming a strategic priority for so many companies. And then finally, why that leads naturally to the elevation of user experience. And I'll share with you some examples of what I'm seeing uh, from our customer experience team clients uh, in terms of how they're tapping user experience expertise and skills, both inside and outside of their organizations. Okay, so the age of the customer. So um, Forrester has been talking about the age of the customer for the last three or four years. We've now organized our entire company around it as a uh, focus for our research. And what we're seeing now is that since 2010, really a obsession about customers who are more empowered than ever uh, is the only way for companies to have a sustainable competitive advantage over, um, over their peers in their industry. And we wanted to put this in a little bit of historical context. So if you look back in the early 20th century, we call that the age of manufacturing. And this was a time when uh, large industrial companies were able to manufacture goods more cheaply or more efficiently or more of them. And so think of Ford, uh, Boeing, GE. These were the companies that uh, had the competitive advantage back then. Um, but as those uh, advantages started to be spread and erode for, for those early leaders, we entered the second age that we talk about here around 1960, the age of distribution, when it was less about manufacturing those goods more efficiently and more about getting them to their places uh, where you wanted them, where you needed them more efficiently. And so that's when Walmart, um, Toyota, and um, UPS, and later, a little later FedEx, really were the dominant players and, and, and were differentiated in that era. But again, their, their advantages eroded, and we entered around 1990 the, the age of information. And this is when connected PCs and you know, people who had access to and control of large flows of information were dominant. So this was the tech rise of the tech companies like Google, like Amazon, and also companies like Comcast who controlled pipes right to your houses, or uh, Capital One who had a huge database that allowed them to better target uh, potential credit card customers. But as cheap processing power as large data sets have again been spread to many more companies and it's no longer a competitive advantage, we've now entered the age of the customer. And so companies like Macy's, Salesforce.com, USAA, the, the bank for, for military families, are differentiating themselves on the basis of providing better customer experiences than their competitors. And I think it's instructive that Amazon is, is on both of the leader lists for the last two eras. And it's because when they started and when they used their competitive advantage with all the, um, their ability to control flows of information, uh, Jeff Bezos was early in playing that advantage to deliver better customer experiences. And you can see that as well in their, their acquisition of, uh, of Zappos a few years ago. This has really been something they've been focused on for a long time. And so when we look at the implications of this, um, if you think about uh, Michael Porter, who you know, has written about competitive strategy, and you think about um, the implications in the age of the customer for some of his themes, 
um, I think it's instructive. You were seeing that within industries, um, competition is becoming fiercer as information um, is more pervasive, right? So uh, competitors know each other's pricing uh, and policies. It's also lowered barriers to entry. And uh, the big company making all their announcements today, I think, is, is a great reflection of that, right? So, so Apple with, with iPods was disrupting uh, the music industry and with phones, they've disrupted uh, camera industries, video recording industries, GPS industries. Um, think about what's happening now uh, with, the, um, with the sharing economy and, and the taxi and hotel industries and the disruption they're facing. It's much easier for new companies to enter um, these markets. And then for, for buyers, they've got more information at their fingertips. So you can be standing in a store looking at products, comparison shopping at that very time, and you could buy that product somewhere else while standing in that company's store. And then there's, there's a lot more uh, substitutes available, uh, right? So think about, obviously, uh, almost perfect digital substitutes, so a, a, a e-book or um, an MP3 as opposed to a compact disc, or less perfect substitutes, but that are cheaper. So uh, conducting a meeting via video conference rather than going and being there in person it's not a perfect substitute, but it sure is a lot cheaper, and it sure is a threat to airline, hotel, car rental industries. And then, of course, ideas can spread more easily because um, the suppliers, you know, people have ideas. They can, they can leave. They can, they can go um, to a competitor. They can go start their own company. And so there's a lot of risks here for companies. So we've, we've talked about this in our research. We see a number of implications, potentially. I wanted to just highlight a few of the implications we're seeing. Um, here and talk about how that leads to the rise of customer experience. So first, we're seeing companies shift from focusing on acquisition of new customers to obsessing about lost customers. It's much more about loyalty for them. And this trend actually predates Age of the Customer, which we sort of marked as starting around 2010, a little bit. It goes to the start of the Great Recession in 2008, because this was when uh, there weren't really any more new customers out there to acquire, and companies' um, survival depended upon keeping the business that they already had, or at least some of the business that they already had. And I actually experienced this firsthand because um, uh, Rachel mentioned in her introduction, I started a, a peer network at Forrester. Might have to switch to this one. Bear with me one second. Is, yeah, thank you. Okay. There we go. Okay. Oh, that's a little loud. Um, at Forrester, um, I started the peer network for customer experience executives that Rachel mentioned in her introduction right at the end of 2008. And so um, that was a horrible time to start most new products or services, but not for us, because to start a new customer experience service at that time, when every single company just about was casting about for ways to uh, drive loyalty with their customers, they were hitting on customer experience just at the time that we were starting a peer network where all these new customer experience executives could get together and share ideas. So it actually worked out really well for us um, at a time when we saw uh, a lot of other companies uh, struggle. The second uh, trend we're seeing, or th that I want to highlight, is that mutualized companies will come back into vogue. So 30 years from now, we've, we've been in this cult of shareholder value, right? Well, this is going to change in the age of the customer. And so now companies like uh, Vanguard or USAA, who are owned by their members, by their customers, they have a real competitive advantage in the age of the customer because they do not have to make uh, trade-offs, decisions between shareholder value and customer value. And a, a great example, um, this is a, a company that was built from the ground up to be customer obsessed. It's called Pure insurance and their brand pyramid here I think highlights some of their customer obsessed DNA right so they talk about their brand essence it's built purely for you they're owned by their members and everything they do and think about is to deliver a better insurance 
experience to their customers. And if they, they take it all the way down to interaction principles for their call center reps, for uh, their claims agents out in the field. And they've grown more than 40% per year since they were founded uh, seven years ago. And of course, they were a new company, so 40% is not a lot on a small base, but that adds up pretty quickly. And they're now cutting into the businesses of some of the, the largest insurance companies. And they've got a net promoter score just below 80, so they're, they're, they're definitely um, converting people to, to being sort of raving fans about this new insurance company. And then uh, the final trend I want to highlight is that customer experience subsumes market. And so rather than uh, Mad Men telling us what products we like and what to buy, instead companies are having to prove the utility, the value they deliver, and reinforce that with each interaction, with each touch to customers. And one of the trends that we're seeing that sort of supports this, that reinforces this, is um, changes in subscription businesses. Um, think about Netflix, um, Dollar Shave Club. These are companies that have, uh, have you on monthly subscriptions, but don't do what that Comcast uh, care representative did back in, in July, where they torture you when you try to uh, cancel your service. They allow you quite easily to pause your service, cancel your service, reduce your service, and come back, because they know each month they're on the hook to uh, deliver value uh, for money. Uh, and this is a good thing, right? So, so it's no longer uh, companies can just overcome bad products, bad service by uh, having slick marketing or advertising. They have to really prove it to us each time. And so the implications of, of these trends and the age of the customer is that customer experience becomes a strategic priority for companies. And we're seeing this in our data. So um, we asked uh, companies back at the end of 2012 uh, we're getting ready to fill this survey again. We, we do it every two years. So to, to, to what degree will improving customer experience be a top priority for your company in 2013? For virtually all companies, it was one of their top priorities. For 23%, as you can see, uh, it was their number one strategic priority. Yeah? What size organizations are we talking about here? Yeah, so uh, on our, this is our uh, customer experience panel. These are all 500 million in revenue or larger. Um, most are 1 billion in revenue or larger. Thank you. Yeah. And actually, uh, I, I was going to sort of uh, turn this back to you and ask at, at your companies, or if if, um, if you're you know small uh, consultants and, and working with companies, where would you put either your company or your main client on this continuum? So for how many would you say? its top strategic priority, customer experience or user experience. I'd like to add a question to that. Um, sure. When you're asking about a customer experience, are people including the whole idea of, I guess, designing a product and user experience and usability in with that, or are they really just talking about the sales and service fulfillment cycle? Yeah, could everyone hear that? So is it, is it sort of comprehensive end-to-end -end design, um, research, testing of products and services rather than just sales and fulfillment? Yeah, they're, um, it's interesting that they started out, I think, a few years ago, I would say, there were much more um, customer experience was um, almost just a slight evolution of customer service, right? It was maybe call center plus, um, you know, responding to email. But it is, is much more now seen as an end-to-end -end uh, continuum from uh, up from marketing, how we set expectations for customers uh, in a, all of our upfront messaging, to how we design products by uh, by reflecting what users actually need and want, and think about our brand, our company, through to how we follow through on that with service, with after sales support, uh, with follow up, uh, with uh, harvesting you know uh, promoters and references, and, and making sure that we're providing a fuller your experience around that. Yeah. I know that your base is a hundred uh, customer experience professionals, not a hundred CEOs. Uh, to what extent are these data biased and how reliable are they as a reflection of the company's priorities rather than the customer experience department's priorities? Yeah, absolutely. Well, so, um, it's a good question. I, I would actually, I would almost submit that they'd be biased the other way, and I'll tell you why. Um, we asked later in the survey, um, how much value do you, does your company think your efforts as a customer experience team are delivering? 
And most of them said, almost no value was, was their was number one answer. Not no value, but almost no value. No value was an option two. And so what we took that as, we followed up with some, some interviews with the, the, our panel, is they're just, they're frustrated. They're, they're hitting their heads against the wall in a lot of these efforts. And I think they feel like companies are, have, are talking about this as, yep, it's a top strategic priority, but they're not actually backing it with real actions that back that up. So I think the nuance in your question that I would maybe tease out a little bit too is that companies are saying this, they're not getting there yet in terms of walking that walk. So saying it maybe is this first step, but um, they've got a lot of work to do to actually get there. So I think this many are saying it, not nearly this many are acting like it's a top strategic priority. Okay, so I'll continue the uh, informal poll of the room. How many, not top strategic priority, but one of the top priorities? Okay, and how many not really on the list at all? Okay, so um, quick math that almost adds up to about what we saw on the chart. Okay. Um, this, this chart, I think, then suggests the next chart I'm going to show you, which is um, talent for customer experience is in demand. So uh, this is a, um, this is trends data from jobs aggregator indeed.com. And they look at job descriptions that contain customer experience in them, and it's seen exponential growth since 2006 that really sort of uh, tilted up around the start of the age of the customer. Obviously, you can see it uh, dropping off from 2013 to 2014, but still up about 1,000% uh, over earlier, in the, uh, about six, seven years ago. And related to this, we're seeing uh, the rise of the chief customer officer. So not the CEO, but a C-level position in charge of customer experience from end to end across an enterprise. So what we saw was in 2011, we started to track this trend from best of our knowledge, from our research, from publicly available data, that there were about 100 chief customer officers around the world. 2013, when we redid that research, we found 730 chief customer officers and earlier this year, when we redid it again, we were up to nine, 925. So we're seeing the rise of this position. Um, as, as the numbers, the, the, the growth in those numbers would suggest, they're new in their roles. Uh, and most of them report directly to the CEO or the COO to ensure that there's end-to-end uh, -end cohesion in customer focus. And right now, about 6% of the S&P 500 have this new C-level customer position across a broad range of industries. And they have a lot of power, right? So 85% of them are a part of the executive management team. But, as you can see, they're new and they're inexperienced. So most of them are the first chief customer officer at their firm. And I think what I found that's been really interesting is when one of these chief customer officers moves to a different role in their company or leaves the company, they're more often not replaced than they are replaced. Usually the role goes away after that first person has it. And then 34% have less than one year of tenure. Most of the rest have less than uh, three years of tenure. And just 12% held previous customer experience positions. So think about that for a second. These people are C-level executives responsible for customer experience across the entire company, and they come to it without any prior knowledge. So let me uh, tell you the story of one of these chief experience officers who's pretty representative because he started out his role with no prior customer experience knowledge whatsoever. In fact, he was a practicing surgeon. Uh, Jim Merlino was the chief experience officer at uh, Cleveland Clinic Hospital. So Cleveland Clinic is, is one of the largest research hospitals in the world. Um, it's got about 45,000 employees. And the name implies that it's based in Cleveland. Uh, but they're, they're a global company now. They've got uh, facilities in all over the U.S., in Canada, in the Middle East, and uh, they're in North Africa now. And um, when Jim took over this job, um, what he noticed is he, he went and chatted with a lot of uh, his peers, uh, fellow doctors and surgeons and some of the nurses he'd worked with, and across the organization, they just really had no idea what patients who are their customers, what they wanted from the hospital experience. They thought it was just about care, right? They thought it was about making sick people or injured people better. 
And when you talk to patients, they had a very different conception of what they wanted. And this was part of the problem for Cleveland Clinic. They were known as great, um, great surgeons. They provided top-notch health care, but they were also known for being cold and having bad bedside manner. And what a lot of the research that other organizations have been doing showed is that bedside manner communication mattered a lot to outcomes. And Cleveland Clinic was ignoring this. And so to fill in this gap, uh, Jim and his team went and did extensive observational research. Um, they, they, they conducted focus groups and interviews with patients. Um, they started uh, going out and they hired ethnographers and they were spending time observing um, employee-patient interactions. They talked to a lot of the employees across the company to try to understand their perspective on the experiences they were delivering. And they, they did surveys as well, they did a lot of quantitative data. And what they, what they did is they distilled all of that knowledge, all that research, into sort of an overall strategy for the experience they wanted to deliver. And they put it into a, um, a half-day training um, curriculum that they trained all of their employees in. So everyone, um, nurses, doctors, uh, band drivers, security guards at the hospital, got this patient experience training. And they used um, a learning map, which is, um, is a tool, an artifact I've seen more and more uh, customer experience teams uh, use to bring customer experience knowledge to uh, the rest of their organizations. And what it does, it's a, it's a large scale visualization, I'll, I'll show you a picture in just a minute of, of a full size one, um, that sort of takes all that data you get from, from research and distills it, abstracts it down to a level where we're looking at pictures with, with little cartoons on them, right? But they have so many um, <clears throat> sort of artifacts and cards that go with it that walk the employees through exercises that they tease out sort of the important bits of information and make it easy for employees to internalize and to understand the behavior change that's going to be required of it. And so what they did is they put um, Cleveland Clinic employees into groups of 8 to 10 like you see here, with a full-size map printed out on the table in front of them. And they, they, this is a ballroom with about a thousand Cleveland Clinic employees at a, in it at a time. And they went through all of their employees over about a six-month period and got them all trained to deliver the right patient experience. And got them all to understand the patient's perspective and what they were doing. And over the next few years, they saw real improvements in their patient experience scores. So if you see here the, um, the blue line and the green line going up pretty consistently year over year there, that's their uh, patient and promoter scores and their patient satisfaction ratings. They also saw employee engagement score, the yellow line, go up during that time, and they've been able to correlate that with um, longer employee retention, uh, higher employee productivity. And then the red line, complaints, which actually I think if you can see, it went up the first year. Uh, after they rolled out this training, which had them a little worried. When they dug in, they realized that was because uh, people were a lot more perceptive, were observing more problems, and were reporting more issues. Uh, but now it's dropped off, and they've, they've cut this significantly to what it was, one of the lowest rates uh, in any hospital in the country. And so training was, of course, not the only thing that they did, right? If they'd just done training. Yeah, question. Did you see a bit more about that? Uh, people reporting more issues initially? Yeah, sure. So um, what they what they were doing is they were training um, they were training all of all of their employees, trying to get them to understand that you're all caregivers, right? We're all part of a larger team. So van drivers, security guards, your caregivers, doctors, surgeons who really thought they were above this, your caregivers too. And so a big part of what they were doing was improving their communication to patients and explaining to them what was supposed to happen what the reason they were giving the medication. And so they were having conversations that were empowering patients to say, well, wait a minute, you didn't follow through on that. You set this expectation, you didn't follow through. So before, it was a very cold, standoffish relationship where some people were didn't, didn't feel comfortable complaining. So it sort of brought out complaints first before they started going out. Yeah? What did they use for incentives to get people to do yeah, great question that tees up my next slide very well. Uh, uh, so, um, as I was saying, it's not the only thing they did. So they linked doctors' annual contract renewals, which is a very unusual model in the healthcare industry, to patient experience ratings. 
And so the doctors had skin in the game, right? Because if their patient experience ratings were below par and they were not on a coaching plan to improve, they would not necessarily renew them for the next year. And they also, they, they did a lot of soft incentives as well, right? So they trained a lot of people across the organization to be coaches for patient experience so they could reinforce the behaviors with their peers. But this was the hard incentive that they provided. Um, and uh, they shared a lot of the data so the doctors felt there was transparency, but that was one of the ways they aligned the behaviors correctly. They also got experimental. So um, they involved their employees in peak end trial interventions to fix uh, critical experience moments. So uh, peak end rule from um, Kahneman and Amos Tversky's research, uh, many of you have seen Thinking Fast and Slow, that book I think summarizes it the best. Um, the idea behind it is that um, a person's memory of their experience, their interaction, is a much better predictor of their future behavior than what actually happened in the experience. So it's how they remember the experience afterwards rather than how they perceive the experience during the experience. And the memory is driven in large part by the peak moments of pleasure or pain and how the experience ends in that experience. And so for Cleveland Clinic, they took this idea and they went and they mapped all of their critical patient journeys and looked for moments where peak pain was way too high or where the end of the experience was, was just a mess. And what they actually found consistently, unfortunately, but at least they identified this over and over again, is that the end of their patient experiences were a mess. Discharge procedures were, they basically just pushed people out the door and wished them good luck. And so that was where they focused their attention on, on interventions and fixing those experiences. They went and um, they appointed a whole team to improve the discharge experience, to be consistent about uh, communications to patients as they were leaving the hospital, to follow up with patients, to make sure that they were adhering to uh, follow-up instructions that they'd been given by the doctors, because that's a huge, uh, huge driver of whether or not they stay better once they've left the hospital. And they've seen, um, they've seen tremendous improvements in patient feedback, patient scores on their discharge procedures because of that. So, ah, and then one more, I forgot, sorry. Um, they instituted what they call leadership rounds. So doctor and nurse rounds are a very common thing in the healthcare industry where they go around each day to, to check in on their patients. But they added um, monthly frontline observations by senior leaders. And what they wanted to do is they wanted to get senior leaders out observing the experience and uh, evaluating as well. And they were, they were getting them in the habit of sort of practicing observational research, those techniques. But they also, they did not stop, they did a lot of that upfront observational research I was talking about. They didn't stop doing that, they continued doing that, and they explained to the executives that this monthly two-hour observation tour they went on was not actual ethnography, was not actual research, right? So they gave them an introduction to the method without confusing them into thinking that that was actually how that research should go. And they also, um, they trained a number of internal employees to be uh, mystery shoppers for their patient experience. Um, now, you think about a uh, mystery shopper for you know, going into a retail store, it's easy enough, you give them a little money, they buy the product, they evaluate the experience. You can't really do that in a hospital, right? Because if you're gonna either give them an ailment or they're gonna fake an ailment, but either way, uh, I think you're on uh, morally dubious ground with that. So they did the next best thing and they trained internal people to, to do Mr. Chuck. And so they've seen tremendous success from this. Uh, Jim Molino's writing a book now on service excellence because they've had uh, so much success. Do you have a question? Um, I just had a quick question on sure. were there added processes, added measurements, added automation as they went through this? Like, did they send people out Beforehand, before everyone got trained, yeah. they add a lot during the process when it was rolled out. Yeah, one of the things I didn't mention. So they did this training for forty-three thousand employees. Um, they before they did it, they first trained five hundred of their employees to be facilitators because they believed strongly that their culture, the training, the the new ideas had to come from within. If it came from an external company. And it was an external company who helped them build that training curriculum and train those facilitators. But if the actual training of their employees came from an external company, it would be rejected. Um, 
And then they also, ahead of training all of those employees, they trained um, their 2,500 roughly managers because um, they believed, and I think they were right, that if they didn't have a plan from the beginning to coach and sustain the new behaviors, the new way of doing things over time, it would, you know, it would start to fall off immediately after the training had concluded. So they put in place all these processes by which managers were supposed to uh, evaluate, observe their uh, employees, their teams uh, conducting themselves and coach and um, uh, you know, sort of give, and give performance reviews that evaluate employees on, on conducting these behaviors. And so that's the other thing they've done. As I mentioned the doctor's annual contracts tied to um, their patient satisfaction ratings. They're also evaluating performance reviews against um, all of these new behaviors that support their patient experience strategy. Again, you mentioned the trial. Oh, um, thinking fast and slow. So, imagine if all of those new chief customer officers were taking on, you know, uh, observational research and, and sort of uh, being much more rigorous about uh, testing and designing new services before they rolled them out, like Cleveland Clinic has. Um, but of course, unfortunately, that's not, not what's happening at most of these companies. Um, that's why they're worthy of sharing their story, because it's exceptional. Um, and the other problem we see is that core customer experience teams are actually quite small. So 65% of them have 10 or fewer members. And these are big companies, in many cases, where they are far from being customer experience leaders. They've got a lot of things that they want these people to do. They're stretched thin. Remember, a lot of them have uh, no prior experience, short tenures. They're just not equipped to institute the large-scale transformation like Cleveland Clinic did. And so this is where the elevation of user experience comes in. And what I'm seeing with my clients, with uh, customer experience executives, customer experience teams, is they're looking to their user experience colleagues, both inside the organizations and outside, right, their agency partners, their consultancies, for really for three, uh, three of your core skills. And I'll go through each of those with some examples of, of companies applying these. So first, uh, I already talked about this little bit the clinic story, um, they're quite interested in observational research. The power of, you know, I mentioned they came, they sort of came from a bit of a customer service background, where they, they do a lot of surveying, they do a lot of um, sort of quantitative metrics, they are realizing belatedly that they really need much deeper insights than only qualitative observational research can provide. And so what we're seeing is companies uh, taking that up much in the way Cleveland Clinic has done. And I think another interesting wrinkle from Cleveland Clinic where they introduced their executives uh, to those methods to give them a sense for what's actually required to understand customers uh, was, was practiced by Sage Software. Uh, so Sage um, is transforming their customer experience, and what they what they did uh, last year, started last summer, is they um, hired an RV and plastered it Sage logos, as you can see, and they put all of their executives on this RV for a cross-country trip to visit dozens of their client companies. They are um, a small business software provider, and so they had the executives. Uh, conducting interviews, sit-down interviews with, with many of their, their users at those companies, uh, conducting site visits. So they'd spend you know, half the day sitting and observing the, uh, the accountant at this you know, pizza parlor and, and at the uh, auto mechanic doing their work, using Sage products, but also what else they had to do because Sage hadn't given them an entire suite that allowed them to do their jobs. And so this, now you've got the executives really understanding, empathizing, energize about their customers, about providing the products and services that they're clearly missing when they go out to visit them. And so this opened the door for the Sage team to, to do real observational research and they followed up this RV tour with a lot of ethnography and um, they, they did a whole series of co-creation workshops where they brought in a lot of these customers and reimagined some of their products and services and um, they've, they've actually trained a lot of their uh, customers to use to do customer journey mapping in their own businesses and help them think through where else they can serve their customers better because they're a B2B company and so they're helping their uh, clients 
work better with their customers to try and see it all the way through uh, the value chain. Another example of um, where I've seen a customer experience team adopt observational research techniques, and Sage really sort of took this on themselves. They worked with some of their internal experts in this area. Um, but Hampton Inn relied on external agency partners that they worked with. Um, and what they did is they spent months observing their best and worst performing hotels to try and tease out the key behaviors that were driving the different uh, performance, different outcomes at those properties. So Hampton is a 2,000 hotel chain around the world. And um, the added wrinkle for them with this observational research is they don't actually own any of their hotels. They're all owned by independent hotel operating companies. So for them to make the case to those companies that they should invest in training for any of their employees, Hampton had to first show an airtight case linkage between higher performing hotels and what the employees did there and uh, results like greater loyalty from customers and higher revenue per available room, which is sort of the, uh, the, the gold star metric in the, the hotel industry. And so what they did is they observed employees and uh, general managers at 20 top performing hotels, 20 sort of mid-tier for the brand, and 20 underperforming hotels. And they netted out sort of nine key behaviors for general managers, another set of key behaviors for employees that correlated with better guest experiences, better uh, financial performance of those hotels. And they, they then they showed that case very clearly to the hotel owners so that they could get their buy-in to conduct this training to invest in it. And then they trained all 2,000 general managers um, in what they called game changers. So there's these nine behaviors. So as an example, the first one that I'm showing here is called connect with your fans. Uh, sort of a, a long, extended, tortured baseball metaphor to all this. But um, they, the, the, the behavior here is that the top general managers interact with guests multiple times a day. And what they observed at the top performing hotels that led them to this was that the, the general managers would be out on the floor in the morning during the breakfast rush, because Hampton has a free breakfast buffet. So they were there greeting customers, chatting with them, restocking the buffet, helping employees do their jobs. And it was a great time to see as many of your guests as possible. Sounds kind of obvious, right? The lower performing hotel general managers were in the back room doing financial paperwork. Well, why were they doing that? Well, through the observational research, they saw that, and they realized that Hampton Corporate had asked their hotels to send them the previous day's financial numbers as soon as possible. So these you know, general managers just trying to comply with corporate, uh, the corporate edict were doing that first thing. But first thing is when you get to see the most of your guests. And at 10.30, the hotel is dead. And they have plenty of time to do this after having seen all their guests. So Hampton realized this remove the policy and train general managers in a new behavior and said, please, don't, you don't have to do it first thing, we'll get it whenever, but just be out on the floor greeting your guests and side by side with your employees. And if they do that, employee performance goes up, loyalty scores from guests go up, and revenue per available room goes up. The other thing we're seeing with observational research is um, CX teams are trying to share it much in a much more comprehensive way with all employees. And so um, one of the things we're seeing, this example here from Prime Therapeutics, which is a pharmacy benefits uh, manager for a lot of the blues plans in the Midwest, um, they created this uh, physical customer experience room, they call it, where they share all of the artifacts from their qualitative research. So they've got their personas, and then they've got a video and audio recording from the research that they conducted from the persona. And they've got sort of representative artifacts from customers who are, would be part of those uh, segments that are represented by the personas. And they, the other thing they did that I like about this example is they made the room portable so they could take it to all of their different offices uh, around the Midwest and ensure that all, you know, about 2,500 employees could go through this uh, about a two and a half hour immersive experience and really be able to empathize and understand their customers. And we're seeing this, I've seen enough of these rooms that I, I wrote a report about them earlier this year um, as, as sort of a tool that companies are using to foster much greater customer uh, understanding and, and empathy. Um, OK, 
Okay, so the next um, sort of user experience ex area of expertise the customer experience teams are trying to tap is really the deep understanding of design process and technique. And specifically, what they want is they want more of their key partners, stakeholders, uh, business uh, associates across their companies to understand what the design process actually looks like and works like. And as, again, I will come back to the fact that they are short tenure, they don't have a lot of experience in this area, they frankly don't fully understand it themselves. So this is where they're relying on your expertise uh, to communicate that to their business partners, probably learn a bit uh, as you're doing that themselves. And so they're really bringing in, um, a lot of times it's outside partners, but they're bringing in uh, people to help them share this knowledge with their organizations because they believe, back to the earlier question about whether this is just a sort of post-sales service or if this is end-to-end, -end, they believe this will allow business people to bring them and their user experience colleagues in much earlier in the process when they can make real inter interventions to the design of products and services. And so um, one example I want to share here comes from Fidelity. Uh, so until last year, Fred Leichter was their chief customer officer. And now Fred is sort of the exception that proves uh, my point about uh, not having background in this area. Fred is one of the few chief customer officers that actually does come from a deep user experience background. He'd been um, with the Fidelity.com team for about 20 years before they elevated him to chief customer officer, doing web design, usability, doing uh, ATM, user interface design. And so he knew the importance of rigorous design processes. And what he wanted to do was to get all of their business stakeholders to understand the design process. And Fidelity had a challenge where they had good customer experience discipline and teams within their silos, but across um, you know, workplace investing, in individual investors and um, their uh, institutional investors, they weren't connecting the dots. And so it was Fred's job to really connect those dots outside of the business units and to really get the entire organization focused on the customer because Abby Johnson, the chairman, had decreed that they needed to be the number one financial services company in terms of customer experience. So what did Fred do? Well, he hired, um, he hired a number of design uh, thinking experts uh, from uh, outside of Fidelity. He went to uh, Stanford D School, he went to Rotman, and he trained hundreds of business stakeholders at Fidelity in design thinking. And so he put them through these one and two day workshops. He made them use uh, popsicle sticks and other things that made them feel a little funny at first, but to help them understand what design really looked like. And what they did is they, they stressed over and over again that they had to obsess about customer problems and questions rather than jumping to solutions, which for business people is a difficult thing to do. So what they did is they teed up some of their big questions, challenges that their customers have that Fidelity wasn't addressing. And one of those is, um, why don't people save enough for retirement? And it's a fact, right? People, most people are not prepared for retirement. And if you're Fidelity, this is a failure on your part, right? Especially even among their customers. Their whole reason for being in business is to make sure these people are saving enough for retirement and they're not accomplishing it. You can imagine they've tried, right? They've rolled out new calculators, uh, new uh, target date funds. Um, but when they put this through the design thinking workshop, as an example, they came up with a much simpler solution. Because they realized people didn't need more tools, more information. Um, people like myself don't even know what as asset allocation means, let alone can I uh, readjust my asset allocation, right? So they, for people like me, they rolled out a program they call 8X. And what it says to their investors is, in the year you retire, you need to have eight times your salary that year saved to have a comfortable retirement. There's a lot of detail under that. That's all they tell their investors. And then they work back from there and say, to be on track at 35, you need to have one time your salary that year saved. 45 3x, 55 5x, 65 8x. And this made it much, much simpler for their investors who were in this class of people who are not sophisticated investors, again, like myself, I'm including myself here, um, to understand whether they were on track. I turned 35 this year, I know where I am. I know where I am, I'm not gonna say, but. 
Um, <clears throat> and so this, this drove much greater um, uh, contribution levels from this, this previously sort of disengaged group when they had conversations with them. But as importantly for Fidelity, it also created hundreds of business people who understood the design process and who were now bringing that perspective to their work. And so Fidelity had a much better group of stakeholders that they could work with. Second example I want to share about design process is uh, from Citrix. And so uh, their SVP of customer experience, woman named Catherine Courage, was, had a challenge, right? She wanted all employees to review and apply the research that their user research team was conducting, but they weren't doing it. Part of the challenge was employees were geographically dispersed, a lot of them were home workers, and they were conducting loads of customer research. It was hard to cut through all of that and share the really relevant bits with the right employees. So they created a digital customer room to share all that research, and this is very much a cousin of the physical customer experience room I shared earlier. Um, what it became is a sort of a repository for all of their research studies. And um, they, they managed to, they, they flag when there's new research, they flag when they've updated research, and they created customized newsletters for um, a variety of different um, employee groups. So software engineers have their own newsletter where they, they, they pull out the, the bits of research that they think are most relevant to them. Product managers, marketers have their own newsletters. And they've seen greater engagement, greater use of the research because of this. But they went another, they went another step, and they created journey mapping stations in all of their offices. So for those employees that are located in their offices, they now have, um, and they have a trained facilitator in each office to, to walk them through this, they can now take the research, take the question or, or challenge or journey that they're wrestling with, and bring it to the wall in small teams and actually map out the journey and try to diagnose with the research uh, where they can make interventions and where they can improve the experiences. And then the final uh, area I'm seeing a lot of interest in, probably not surprising at all, is uh, mobile sign testing. But specifically, where my customer experience clients are interested in the capability of this beyond just obviously um, the uptake of mobile from, from consumers and, and, and trying to, um, to keep up with that is mobiles, the possibility of mobile to connect experiences where consumers are crossing from digital to physical to other channels and back, and especially to improve, to, um, to augment their physical, their, their person to person uh, experiences and interactions. So let me give you a few examples here. And this is an area where I think uh, mobile teams, the mobile parts of UX teams have uh, a huge opportunity to sort of expand up to some of the key business stakeholders of the organization what, what you can do, what you can accomplish from an organization. So uh, one example, 7-Eleven. Um, they looked at how mobile would fit into its uh, existing customer journeys. So they have key personas. Uh, they mapped all of the existing journeys for their personas. They worked with an uh, external mobile agency. And then they, they, they sort of looked at where, from their research, where they thought it was most likely that um, users' use of mobile would alter those journeys, and also where they could make proactive interventions with their mobile app and their mobile site to augment those journeys. And so what they did is they sort of plotted along their journeys, and you can see at the top there, where mobile would come in. And so that led them to, um, for example, their mobile app is uh, contextually aware in a few different ways, right? It knows what the weather is. It knows the time of day. It knows how close the customer with the mobile app installed is to their nearest store. It knows some of their purchase history as well. And so it can send them a targeted ad on a cold um, night for hot chocolate rather than for uh, a, a Diet Coke, right, a, a cold drink. And what they've seen is this targeted advertising um, is, is driving much greater store traffic because it's more relevant, it's more valuable to their customers. So they're seeing about 40% higher uptake of these offers uh, because of this contextually aware um, mobile app. Another example of this is, uh, is Delta. So a few years ago, they saw a real dip in their customer satisfaction, customer experience scores. And they went back and looked at the data, and they were surprised to find that the real source of the data, uh, the, the drop, was coming from 
rare events for them, for any airline, but um, that most of the drop was driven by um, customers complaining about canceled flights and lost bags. Now, those are horrible experiences, right? But um, they're rare, so Delta was a little caught off guard that this is why this was happening. So they, they mobilized the entire organization to address both of those issues. And they set a goal of being by far the lowest uh, airline for cancellation rates. And they've got there, actually. There's a great article earlier this year in the Wall Street Journal on all the operational things that they did to reduce cancellations. I won't go into that here, because that's not necessarily our area of focus. But what they, what they also did to complement that, I think was interesting, is when flights are still canceled for Delta, they now, through their mobile app, will proactively alert you that the flight has been canceled, and a lot of airlines do that now. But they will proactively suggest and allow you to book, rebook, on up to three different flights that could get you to your final destination, often through different connections. And my colleague, um, Harley Manning, was telling me just yesterday that he was um, flying back from Denver on Delta, and his flight got canceled, and he got the alert, and he had gotten to the airport early, and um, they, they were able to get him on an earlier flight. So his canceled flight actually led to him getting home even earlier uh, than he otherwise would have. Whereas I was talking to my, uh, my younger brother this weekend, and he flew United back from the West Coast to uh, start uh, his semester in law school. And they canceled his flight, and his only uh, course of action was to go stand in a long line and hope to get served by the rather frazzled uh, United employee while he was on hold trying to get through someone in their call center, which was also overwhelmed because this was San Francisco, one of their hubs, and they canceled a lot of flights out there. So I can show you that even for a bad experience with the intervention of mobile, it's possible to greatly improve how that ends up for customers. The other thing they've done is their mobile team and their CX team and their operations team were working together on, on these interventions anyway. So they decided to align their mobile strategy around phases of the customer journey. And so they've got, when you're, um, you're way in advance of the flight, they've got just as you're preparing to travel, and then they've got during the flight period. Um, and so for example, that led them to the uh, idea of while you're, uh, sorry, while you're flying, they would add um, a real-time tracker of your checked bags for you in the app. And the, the, the app sort of flips these different functionalities depending on where you are in your flying journey. Now it doesn't make it any less likely that your bag will get lost, um, but it does give you fair warning, and it does prevent you from standing sort of forlornly watching an empty carousel circle waiting for a bag that's never going to show, right? So again, it's, it's not going to fix a terrible experience, but it will make it a little less painful and give you a little more information. And I showed the chart earlier, but um, their scores are now really climbing back up as they've addressed these um, rare but really frustrating problems. And uh, last year, uh, in, well, sorry, this year, Forrester's 2014 Customer Experience Index in the Green Line, they leapfrog JetBlue and are just behind Southwest in our uh, airline ratings, number two. So, summarize. Um, executives at these companies, in the age of the customer, they know they should be customer obsessed, right? But they need guidance to channel that enthusiasm productively. I think the companies that have introduced them to the powers of observational research, while also balancing that between not you know, deceiving them into thinking that just doing monthly leadership rounds or taking an RV tour is sufficient, I think have, got, have struck the balance right. And I think your expertise, your knowledge in this area, is something that can be really valuable to customer experience teams, whether it's showing them the, the impact, the knowledge gained from some of the research you're already doing, or describing, helping them think through how you could bring those techniques to executives to make them understand more deeply what they're actually committing to when they make customer experience a strategic priority. And second, customer experience teams need, want their uh, stakeholders, their business stakeholders, to understand uh, the design process, but barely understand themselves. And so again, this is an area where they, they need your help, they need your support in executing this change in thinking across the organization. And then finally, they believe that they need to create connected, seamless experiences and augment their physical interactions, and they think mobile can help them achieve that goal. 
So that's absolutely an area where customer experience teams want help, want support, um, want to hear from you. So that's all I've got. Any, happy to take any more questions or happy to get out of the way of uh, refreshments and we can continue the conversation over there. But uh, any further questions? Yeah, uh, Rachel? Uh, yeah, you mentioned that most of the people who took on this job of um, chief customer officer didn't have a background in it. Yeah. So what was their background typically in um, what was their background typically in? There is no one typical background in terms of where they came from in the organization. What's critical about where who they are is that they have been long tenured in their organizations for the most part. And they have built up strong networks across the company. Their job is to influence and to collaborate with key people across the organization. And so it's often someone like Jim Erlino who has been at the Cleveland Clinic for a while, who was a respected surgeon, and when he moved into that position, would be seen as someone to take seriously to respect. So they come from operations, sales, marketing, everywhere, but usually not customer experience and no one place. Yeah. In the absence of a CXO, um, has there been any kind of trends in terms of others that kind of uptake that responsibility? Yeah, that's a great question. So they don't have a chief customer officer who's sort of on point for uh, being responsible. I would say the trend is it was, it's historically customer experience has been in marketing. And the trend is away from that. The trend is to having it either dispersed in a federated model um, or having it a standalone under a chief customer officer. In the absence of having a standalone under a chief customer officer, often the director or VP level will report up still into the C-suite, so sort of a gap there. But it's then, if it, you're making it a strategic priority, naturally what flows from that is that the CEO or the COO, if not another C-level person, should be on point to oversee the end-to-end -end customer experience. Yeah. Um, I don't know if this is an exact question. It's really about any observations you have. But um, on one of your first slides, you were talking about the age of the customer. Yeah. You referenced folks like Amazon, Salesforce.com, more digitally oriented companies. You know, a lot of the examples were higher touch human interaction. Yeah. Um, so when you look at some of these companies like Amazon, um, maybe their consumer area is used to dealing with things at high volume and digital, yet when you look at something like Amazon Web Services, it's not very user friendly. Yeah. So where are companies in balancing that digital experience versus that human touch? Yeah, I, I, I was, it's, it's funny, I was having sort of a, a conversation before we started um, about this, about um, self-service digital interactions, um, siphoning off a lot of the easy or maybe sort of the interactions that probably should be in that channel, leaving the more complex, more difficult transactions to in-person, to call center. Some companies are, are, are embracing that and are, um, are, are retraining call center staff or changing metrics in the call center to uh, get away from average handle time and, and focus more on actually helping those people with those difficult problems solve them. But I would say I'm not yet seeing I'm not yet seeing companies who, as many companies who have named this as a strategic priority, understand all the way through what the implications of that are. Um, so it's very early days on things like what Cleveland Clinic did with retraining all employees in a new set of behaviors that are fundamentally customer-centric. I see that only in a few companies um, where they've done the training, they've got a coaching set up in place to reinforce, and they've built the performance reviews in a way that will ensure that the in-person experiences, whether they're you know uh, over phone or whether they're literally in person, will be truly customer-centric, will be much more empathic. It's starting to happen, but that's earlier, I'd say, than the, the enablement of better digital and self-service. Yeah? Um, do you have a favorite data point or anecdote about um, getting a C-suite to shift their thinking from focusing so much on new customer adoption instead focusing on customer experience as a way to spur the new customer adoption? Um, yeah, actually, this, this is a few years ago. Yeah, sorry, repeat the question. So the question was an, an anecdote, that, uh, a favorite anecdote that sort of 
um, highlights the, the switch from new customer acquisition to uh, maintaining existing customer relationships, right? Um, I can think of a lot, but the one that immediately came to mind as I was preparing that slide as you asked your question was, uh, this was back in, uh, in 2009, and it was, um, it was at our London Customer Experience Forum, and we had a speaker from The Economist explaining the implications of the Great Recession that had just happened, that we were still all in a state of shock from. And he showed a chart that was Volvo truck sales um, year over year. And he didn't have 2008 Q4 on there yet. And he asked us to guess what it was. And you know, the number had been trending you know, thousands. It dropped to seven. Seven trucks they sold. So those are, these, a new truck is a new customer, right? And so what, they, what that meant for them is they were relying on their maintenance contracts for revenue because they were not selling any new trucks. Uh, right after the global recession hit, and I think it was a slap in the face to them to realize, oh my god, we have to really put everything we have into keeping our trucks running and keeping our existing customers who have trucks and are going to buy a new truck anytime soon happy with us as their maintenance provider, which actually, you know, think about Boeing, think about uh, some of these big manufacturers, a lot of their revenue does come from those, those maintenance service relationships, but that was one that struck me because new customers went away overnight. For that, that, that product. Yeah, here and then I'll with it. A little bit more divergent question. Uh, any comments on Market Basket? <laughs> I, I find it highly encouraging. I mean, it showed employee power uh, in a way where they cited, they are not unionized, but they sort of, in a way, acted as if they were, right? They, there was sort of uh, collective action there that was important to them holding out and um, aligning with the friendly CEO, which I think is amazing that all they really wanted was their the nice CEO back, right? They weren't, um, you know, there wasn't action for more than that. But um, I, I was heartened by that, 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 you know, that seemed to be a customer experience story. It did, because it wasn't just the employees. Yeah. It was the customers. Yeah. It wasn't just the frontline employees. It was the managers and the frontline employees. And one of the things I didn't hear you say when talking about customer experience is that if you want your employees to treat your customers decently, you'd better treat your employees decently, which is, I think, a, a thing a great many organizations have lost sight of. Yeah, I think you're right. I think maybe in my uh, my customer experience center view of the world, I see a lot of companies coming back to that, realizing they got way far away from that. It's part and parcel with the moving away from obsession with shareholder value, realization, getting back to service profit chain, right? Treat employees well, they'll treat customers well, they'll treat shareholders well. It's in that order. So yeah, I think it's a great point. I just, I, I see that all the time, so I, I, I'm maybe not as attuned to it as I should be. Hi. Great talk. My question was actually just along the lines of what you brought up. I'm sorry. I could see the way you were flagging that it was related. No, no, I no, no, that's okay. I, my, my question was all around, so we're talking about customer experience and the, the new thing that we're in now. But I think, um, as he was saying, that just as important as focusing on your customers is to focus on your employees. You as a company need to focus on your employees, I feel, just as much as your customers, so that the employees can all collectively focus on the customer, and I just want to know. Yeah, and, and so, un, un, I, I don't know if it's unfortunate, but, but often the best way, the, the, the most direct way to get companies to realize the importance and value of their employees, again, is by making the, it's a, it's a shorter path from treat our customers well, we see it show up in repeat business, in incremental purchases, in references that bring us new customers. That's a shorter path for them to see the business value of it, and then they work back from there um, to the employee experience. And, and I, where, I would, where I would just um, challenge you both a little bit is, Part, one of the things that I'm seeing some companies run into, and this is a lot, a lot of my conversations lately, because I'm the culture guy, I've been around, is that like, well, we went and improved the employee experience, we didn't see any, any gains from it. And it's not improving employee experience in just a shorter work hours, 
nice and bright rooms, free food, right? What, what employees want, they're not going to tell you this necessarily. It's, it's like customers. You can't just ask them and then do what they say. Employees are the same, right? They're people. They want a sense of purpose. They want to feel um, that they have a job that matters. They're making a difference. They want to feel that they're growing when they come to work each day. And they want to feel that they're contributing to something good. And what makes me feel good is that the number of companies trying to now deliver great customer experiences, they're all giving their employees a better sense of purpose. So I think I can talk about this. I was, I was out with uh, um, the manufacturer of Proactive Skincare uh, the other day, and if you know their business model at all, it's horrible. They treat their customers like um, they're trying to trick them, right? They, instead of, um, instead of selling them skincare that works and getting money back, they sort of lock them in to this continuity agreement. Month after month, they, sell, they send them more product than they need, take their money, they make it almost impossible to cancel. They do what the Comcast rep did uh, when they try to cancel. And their employees are demoralized, they feel bad, and it's hurting their company, right? Their, their employees have, um, they have high turnover, they have low productivity among their employees. And there's now an effort internally to get to, to, to really transform their customer experience where they're just, they believe in their products. They, they, they feel, you know, when someone has bad skin and proactive fixes it, I mean, you change their life. And they need to believe in that and, and feel good about that rather than they all feel horrible when they go home at the end of the day. They, I was interviewing people there and they, they feel guilty. And so um, they're trying to have customer experience, delivering great customer experiences, bring a sense of purpose back to their employees and motivate them, excite them to do their jobs rather than feeling guilty that they work for this company when, people, when they bring it up and anyone's been a customer, they, they start yelling at them, right? It's so like for people who work at Comcast, that's demoralizing. And so that's where I think customer experience really comes in here for the employee experience. It's the uh, sharp point of the sphere that, that gets them to fix the employee experience too. Yeah. Um, so Sam, you talked about the chief experience officers that barely understand experience. Except for Fred. I just I don't want to lump him in with that. Well, it, yep. that, or have uh, limited experience within the field. It seems the more dangerous group are the ones that think they know about customer experience. <laughs> Um, and I think more frequently that um, empathy is considered an understanding of customer experience, yeah. um, which is great that people can have empathy but not necessarily know how to translate that into results. Um, do you have any anecdotes of, of how to influence um, companies that are in that, in that position and, and get them to, to keep that position open rather than have one person in it and then sort of dismiss it? You mean putting someone in charge of customer experience and then just leaving them to, to do the work, or? To, um, so you had an earlier slide where there would be one person in that role, and then the role would go away. Oh, and the role would go away, yeah. Thankfully, that is starting to change now. And um, what I, I'm, I'm working on research now, on, we're, I'm seeing a huge uptake now, but again, this is just happening in um, developing a curriculum for customer experience that's uh, appropriate for every level, every part of the organization. So companies are, are instituting this training. The training includes an understanding of what customer experience is, why it matters to the company, putting it in context for specific worker jobs, um, providing um, you know, active listening and empathy training, but also helping them translate that into action. So they're doing a lot of training around journey mapping um, and other you know sort of uh, actions that they can take. You know, sort of action planning once you identify some of the, the pain points, like root cause analysis, um, you know, five whys exercises. They're rolling this training across the organization, so there isn't that um, let's stop when we just sort of reach the starting line mentality. Um, Sadly, a lot of companies have to declare victory, realize they were wrong, and go back to it for, for, it to, for the realization to hit. A lot of them have to. And actually, I think it's interesting, Jim Rolino is another exception in, in Chief Customer Officer. He replaced uh, someone who was in the role directly. He's one of the only ones I've seen do that so far. And she was failing in her job because she had not gotten the entire organization to understand that they were all responsible for it for the experiences they were delivering. She was trying to do it just out of her uh, patient experience team. So I think that's, it was a good example of lesson learned for them that this had to be more than just the patient experience team delivering it. It had to be something that was a new way they were going to do things forever, not a temporary initiative for a matter of months or years. 
Yeah. How is it that marketing isn't this, the hub of all of this? And does that mean, does that include product management? I mean, has this just evaporated? Well, no, it certainly hasn't. And in fact, um, <laughs> see, CMOs probably still think they should own customer experience. And um, we write a lot of research that they think could have a bad impact, but hopefully it won't, that tells marketing teams and chief marketing officers that they need to help lead this transformation to, to become customer-centric enterprises. So they're very much still in the game. I think, they're, I think they're seeing the fall off in their traditional ways of generating leads, generating business. And that's um, opened their eyes to maybe, maybe there is validity to this, there is value to this. So I don't want to be completely cynical about them. I think they, they can be reformed. Um, and they, they might be a good example of you know, having a little bit of knowledge in this area and that being dangerous. Um, but what we're seeing is a shift in power in these organizations where the C-level person is coming in, the C-level customer person is coming in now more and more above the CMO or at least peers with them rather than um, the highest customer experience person reporting up to a CMO. So that's helping. like um, companies are doing a few things. One, uh, they were looking for customer experience people. They're just getting them in. Now, um, companies who are really tailoring their strategies are, um, if they're hotels, they're, it's guest experience, so that wouldn't show up. If it's um, member-owned companies, it's member experience, if it's patient experience with Cleveland Clinic, um, it's all these different experiences. But I'm also seeing now, I, I didn't put the charts in here, but I, I ran all the same uh, trend data just to see what was happening for user experience, service design, uh, mobile designers, a few other areas. And those just went steaming straight through uh, the last year. So it's possible that now they're fleshing out their teams. One, they've got the customer experience people in, and they're starting to fill in around them with some of these other positions. But that's a, that's a theory, that's a hypothesis that I need to test for. Well, we don't have to stop talking, but we probably should start eating, right? <laughs>